Good evening and welcome to the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law. We're delighted that you were able to join us today for the annual Rome Lecture. Um, I have the privilege of introducing Professor Hoffman who's going to introduce our speaker, but I can't help but take a little moment out to, to say something about our Professor Gluck. Um, so she was famous to me before she was famous. Before she was a professor, she was a staff member in the office of U.S. Senator Paul Sarbanes. For those of you who know my bio, I also was a staff member in the office of Senator Paul Sarbanes. And Professor Gluck followed me in the office. And every time I would see the senator, he would say, have you met Abby Gluck? You have to meet Abby Gluck. And I never got to meet Abby Gluck. Uh, until about two years ago, where as professors we finally bumped into each other. But she was a star in that office, and I know he was uh, so incredibly proud of her uh, that he over and over again wanted to make sure that, that I got to meet her. She was kind enough to join us today for, for this lecture, so thank you for that. Um, great law schools have one important thing, and that's great students. And, excuse me, that's great people, and we have that here at Maryland Carey Law. That includes our students, our alumni, our faculty, and our staff. Um, and today we are the beneficiaries of the loyalty to this law school of an alumnus, Stuart Rome, and his family and his friends. And I'm extremely grateful for their decision to uh, fund this lecture and for their generosity. The intelligence, energy, and dedication of so many of the law school's community have produced some extraordinary assets, and today we're celebrating those. For example, we're fortunate to have one of the top, excuse me, not one of, the top uh, law and health care program in the country. And I saw uh, Professor Rothenberger here, Rothenberg here today, um, and so I wanted to specifically thank you for just all the work you did in starting this program and helping it uh, get to where it is today. And, uh, and thank you to Professor Diane Hoffman for taking that and running with it and bringing our health law program to, to just uh, the top, the top health care program in the country, but also to just, it, if you're not here and you don't see the energy and vitality that the program brings to our community, uh, it's just incredibly, incredibly special. So thank you uh, to the two of you. Uh, in addition to directing the healthcare law program, Diane has made outstanding scholarly contributions at the intersection of law, ethics, and public policy. Her work on advanced directives, pain treatment, and termination of life support is recognized internationally. And her colleagues have recognized her superb skill in the classroom this summer when the American Society of Law, Medicine, and Ethics bestowed on her its J. Healy Health Law Teachers Award, something we're particularly proud of. And finally, I'd like to thank Professor Hoffman, Virginia Rothhorn, the Managing Director of the Law and Health Care Program, and the members of the Student Health Law Association for organizing today's event. Thank you very much. So uh, I'll now turn over the microphone to Professor Hoffman, who will tell us more about today's program and its speaker. Thank you again so much. Thank you, Donald, and um, thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, it's really, um, this lecture is something we look forward to every year. Um, it, I think uh, this one today promises to be as interesting and challenging um, as Stuart Rome's life and his work. Um, so our Stuart Rome lecture was established in January of 1984 to honor the memory and life of Stuart Rome. Um, he was a, uh, a native of Baltimore and an attorney, a community activist, a patron of the arts, and a humanitarian. And despite a challenging career, um, first uh, with the Attorney General's Office in Maryland and then at the law firm of Venable, Bacher, and Howard, he um, uh, did volunteer work um, for a number of organizations in the state and the city, including the NAACP, um, the Mayor's Advisory Committee on the Arts, um, the Baltimore Association of Retarded Citizens, the Maryland State Arts Council, the American Civil, Liber Civil Liberties Union, the Baltimore uh, Jewish Council, and the Baltimore Museum of Art. Um, Mr. Rome passed away in 1983, and his family and friends uh, established this lecture in his memory. 
Um, our annual Rome lecture is just one of the many ways that the Law and Healthcare Program serves as a platform for discussing uh, today's most uh, pressing health law and policy questions. And the program um, has been a pioneer in healthcare law since, as you just heard, um, Professor Karen Rothenberg started the program actually 30 years ago. Um, we've uh, grown since then, and I think we've kept true to her mission, which was to have a robust program that combines education and research on emerging healthcare issues um, from both a legal and an interdisciplinary perspective. And we now have 11 faculty members, 14 adjunct faculty members. We have four uh, health law clinics. We offer 26 externships in health law. And uh, last year, we graduated a record number of students with our health law certificate, 48. Um, our ultimate goal is to train um, lawyers uh, and policymakers capable of meeting the new challenges um, and comp uh, increasingly challenging issues of health care. Um, the passage of the Affordable Care Act has added a new layer, I think, of complexity in the field. And um, even experts, I think, at the center of the reform are still trying to understand um, uh, much of the law and its implementation. Um, and so we are so proud today to have with us Professor Abby Gluck, um, one of the experts, uh, to talk about the Affordable Care Act. Um, Professor Gluck joined Yale Law School in 2012, having previously served as, as an associate professor of law uh, and a fellow at Columbia Law School. Um, she writes about Congress and the political process, recently publishing two articles in the Stanford Law Review based on an extensive empirical study about the realities of the congressional lawmaking process. Pro Professor Gluck also has an ex extensive experience as a government attorney. Prior to joining Columbia, she served in the administration of the New Jersey Governor John Corzine as the special counsel and senior advisor to the New Jersey Attorney General. She also served in the administration of the New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg as Chief of Staff and Counsel to the Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services and Senior Counsel in the New York City Office of Legal Counsel. Professor Gluck earned her JD from Yale Law School and following law school clerked for then Chief Judge Ralph K. Winter on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and for U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. As you know from Dean Tobin's remarks, uh, prior to law school, um, she worked in the U.S. Senate for Senator Paul Sarbanes. The title of Professor Gluck's talk today is The Challenges of the ACA in the Courts, the Congress and the States, the new, um, well, we had a longer title, The Legal Political Twists and Turns of the Most Controversial Statute in Modern Times. I think this title captures the complexities that health lawyers and policymakers face as we contemplate the future of our healthcare system and move forward in making necessary reforms. And with that, I'll turn the mic over to Professor Abby Gluck. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, it's so nice to be here. I want to thank the Dean and Professor Hoffman for their uh, very generous uh, introductions. Uh, and also, just want to send out a special mention to the really wonderful and special health law faculty at this law school. Uh, they are uh, one of the very top health law faculties in the nation, and they have personally provided me with so much mentoring and support for the last eight years that I really am, will forever be grateful to them. Um, so uh, I love Baltimore. I have my first three jobs out of college in Baltimore, as you just heard. Uh, we may be seeing the great, great senator at some point in this lecture, in which case I will stop and say hi in the middle. Uh, and, and, uh, but I will say that it is particularly nice being uh, invited back to Baltimore when it's not baseball season uh, because, oh, and here he is. Uh, I, just, I just mentioned you, Senator. Welcome to the law school. Um, I just talked about how much I love Baltimore, Senator, uh, and uh, how uh, now I'm very intimidated because now that he's here, I better be really brilliant, uh, or else I'll be, or else he'll be disappointed. Uh, but I will say it's really nice uh, being here when it's not baseball season. I spent two years of my life here having nasty Yankees slurs being fingered on my car windows. Um, <laughs> because of my New York plates, and I'm a Mets fan and hate the Yankees. And so <laughs> the whole thing was really troubling, so I'm very happy that uh, we're in basketball season. Uh, so let me get back to health law. And um, 
What I hope to do today is to try to situate health law in a more modern legal and political framework. And I'll tell you what I mean by that, but after I do that, then I want to situate it in some very current controversies that are plaguing the Affordable Care Act, which I'm going to call the ACCA, and I'm going to talk about its path through the Congress, the states, and the courts. As most of you know, the Supreme Court has recently decided to hear another very big challenge to the Affordable Care Act, so we're going to have a big opinion before the end of June of this year, and I'm going to talk about that case, King versus Burwell, at the end of my remarks. So let me just suggest and talk, start by this, talking about this modern framework. Um, health law has historically been conceptualized in the field of private law, a law from the ground up, law made by the states, and even by the profession itself uh, in its regulation of doctors. Um, and in the academy, you often still see health law analyzed this way. We talk about private actors, we talk about markets, and we talk about the special relationships in health law. Um, but it's very hard to look around today and to think that this private, local, non-federal framework really accurately describes the current health law landscape. Uh, and my big overarching point for today is that health law has really transitioned and transformed into a field of public law, which is a field where the defining characteristic is the role of the government, and in particular, the federal government. And that's not to say the states and the profession don't have an important role in certain areas, but it is to say that this is now the primary relationship. The ACCA is a culmination of that, but of course it started a long time ago, 50 years ago, uh, with Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. So in this new era of health law, the primary mode of lawmaking is not the states or the profession, but it's Congress, big complex federal statutes implemented by federal courts and federal agencies. So why does this matter? Uh, it matters because I think we don't get a lot of health law professors or health law scholarship talking about Congress, thinking about the particular pathologies of Congress unrelated to health law, like spending rules or gridlock, that affect how Congress is made. We don't really have a modern account of federalism in health law, or really a deep understanding of administrative health law, the role that federal agencies play in implementing health law in the modern times. And if we understand health law as public law, we also need to think more about what it means to have federal courts in the game. Um, here it's important to understand that with this federal statutory landscape of health care, the federal judiciary is now in the field in a way that it has never been before. And the federal judiciary has its own pathologies that are totally unrelated to health law, but that are going to affect health law. Uh, one of those pathologies is the ongoing fight in the federal courts about how statutes should be interpreted. And that fight is going to impact the Obamacare case, June, King versus Burwell. I'll talk about that at the end of the remarks. Um, so obviously this is a big project, uh, and I'm not going to address everything here. I'm going to try to touch on each of these areas uh, and give you a taste of the kind of arguments and inquiries that I suggest we should be making. So uh, let's start with Congress. Uh, every transformative statute has its own special story, uh, and that includes the particulars of the path the statute took through Congress. The ACCA story is very unique. And in order to defend or improve on the ACCA, you need to understand its legislative context. So I'm going to spend a few minutes with that. I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, the ACCA is going to go down in history as the textbook example of what I'm going to call unorthodox lawmaking, a term uh, coined by political scientist Barbara Sinclair to connote the end of the schoolhouse rock process. Um, <laughs> I've written, I showed that little video in my legislation class, but I don't have time to put them up there now. I'm a bill, I'm a bill. So anyway, so, um, so why does this matter? Okay, it matters because all of the Supreme Court statutory interpretation rules are based on the textbook assumption of how Congress works. The Supreme Court assumes statutes go through a linear process, that there are not complex deals, and that statutes are consistently drafted and cleaned up. Um, again, this is going to be important when I come back to discuss King. Uh, the ACCA is unique, and here are a few ways in which it is. It's the combined product of five congressional committees' work, two in the House and two in the Senate. The committees divided over the ACCA's federalism structure. The committees in the Senate wanted the insurance exchanges in the Act, the insurance marketplaces, to be state-run. The House wanted those to be federally run. They did not want the states involved. The critical thing to keep in mind is that Nobody thought that the states needed any convincing to do this job. 
Instead, states' rights folks were insisting that they be given the frontline opportunity to implement these exchanges. And in fact, you needed to get rid of the federal public option from the Senate bill in order to get the last necessary vote in the Senate, which was Joe Lieberman, who insisted that we get rid of the public option. So the Senate's proposed bill emerged without any kind of federal, without, without uh, putting the states to exchanges at the front lines, and it passed by a vote of 60 to 39 in 2009. More on that in just a second. So the House uh, was vigorously opposed to this bill, and the plan was going to be for the House and Senate to duke it out and come to some compromise, and then the Senate would have to change its bill by amendment to reflect the compromise. That didn't happen. Why? Something else happened. Senator Kennedy passed away, uh, and the Democrats lost their 60th vote in the Senate. If you learned in school that, fit, that our Senate is a majoritarian body and that 51 is the magic number, ask Senator Sarbanes and he will tell you that 60 is the magic number in the Senate because you need 60 votes to close the debate and move to a vote. With the passing of Senator Kennedy, the Senate no longer had those 60 votes. What was significant about this for the Affordable Care Act is that it meant that the version passed by the Senate when Senator Kennedy died that was supposed to be just a starting offer in the negotiations, that version had to be the law that was passed because no other amendment was going to get through the United States Senate. Right? In the end, it was Nancy Pelosi who in many ways is the unsung hero of health reform because she twisted enough arms in the House to get the House to accept a bill that put the states first when the House vowed to do that over their dead body. Okay? The other very important piece to understand about this is because of this unique process, there was no conference committee. Conferences where statutes are cleaned up. Conferences where differences between the chambers are reconciled. The ACA didn't have that because of the passing of Senator Kennedy and the necessary freezing in time of the text as in effect when he died. So why am I telling you all this story? Um, it's critical because statutory interpretation doctrine is now going to be the bread and butter of health law because health law is now statutory law and because the statute has already survived its major constitutional challenge in 2012. The Hobby Lobby contraceptive mandate case, if you followed that last year, that was also a statutory interpretation case, by the way, and they're all going to be statutory interpretation cases for now. The ACUS procedure is critical because courts are applying these textbook assumptions to a statute that defies a textbook story. And let me give you a very simple example. In the 2012 constitutional litigation, the briefing made a very big argument about the absence in the ACA of a so-called severability clause. Severability clauses are clauses that Congress puts into statutes to say if part of the statute is found unconstitutional, as the Medicaid expansion ultimately was, we want the rest of the statute to stand. Um, the briefing made a very big deal about the fact that the House version had a severability clause and the Senate version did not even though the court applies a general presumption that even when Congress does not include a severability clause, it, it, we defaultly presume that Congress intends statutes to be severable. Everybody made a very big deal saying, well, this is intentional. We had a severability clause in the House bill. It disappeared from the final bill. We should infer from that that Congress wanted the entire ACA to go down with the ship when the Medicaid expansion was held unconstitutional. So even from my small tutorial on the legislative history, I hope you can see why this argument is irresponsible, and I actually think it's malpractice, okay? And the reason it's malpractice is that you now know that nobody cares about the House bill when it comes to the discussion of the ACA. The House bill was never on the table. It was never part of a merged discussion between the House and Senate. It doesn't matter at all, right? And the Supreme Court almost bought this argument uh, without some smart people coming in and explaining that the ACA's legislative history sort of pushes this argument to the side. These are the kinds of arguments that health law advocates and professors are going to have to make uh, if we're gonna, in the context of this super statute that is the health reform example. Okay, so one more point about the Congress, and then I'll move on to, to the states. But you know, understanding health law as a federal statutory field is also very important from the perspective of policy reform. Many people are very disappointed that the ACA didn't do more. Um, but it's unusual to have big sweeping changes when there's a pre-existing landscape of federal legislation, right? Political scientists have shown for years that Congress acts incrementally, incrementally and path dependently. And the ACA exemplifies this. It did not wipe the slate clean. It did not fix the pre-existing fragmented landscape of health law. Medicare is run by the federal government. Medicaid is run by the federal government and the states. Then we got the private insurance system. The ACA put all this together and improved on it, but it didn't fix it. And it's, so 
it's not the statute anyone would have written had they started from scratch, right? And in fact, the ACCA entrenches this pre-existing fragmentation, and it's going to make it harder to undo down the line. Um, so that's a little taste of the kinds of arguments you might make from the ACCA's legislative context. I'm not going to talk much about the agency implementation, not because it's not important, it is, but it's too complex to, con to talk about in a short lecture. The one point I do want to make is that the subject matter and the need for compromise led to an unprecedented number of delegations in this statute. There are several hundred, and as a result, uh, the six different agencies involved in implementing statute have had to act under intense time and pressure. And the result of that has been some very unorthodox administrative uh, processes that don't look at all like the textbook notice and comment rulemaking process that you tend to learn about in law school. Um, so that's another unorthodox story that we'll have to await another day. Uh, but agencies aren't the only story when it comes to health policy implementation. The states also have a traditionally important frontline role in implementing health law. And so I want to talk about federalism for a few minutes and how the ACCA's federalism context has also been very unusual. Um, one of the most prominent books on healthcare federalism was written right after the Clinton effort failed in 1993, and it predicted that health law would move toward a reduced federal role and an increased state role in setting policy as well as in administering and financing it. Well, that's not what we have, obviously, now. Uh, instead, we had HIPAA, and after 1993, we had Medicare, Part C and D, we had the High Tech Act, and now we have the ACCA. So we have a massive federalization, and one that could have displaced the states, but didn't, right? Congress voluntarily left states in the picture. Um, there was a whole industry of law professors out there right now, I promise you, debating whether this ACCA version of state-federal relationships advances federalism. Right? whether the kind of state implementation of federal law simply treats the states as bureaucrats and servants, or whether it advances state power. Um, I, do, uh, I do fall on the side of those who believe that the ACCA does advance federalism, and that's because the, only, the alternative to Congress's intervention in the statute wasn't leaving everything to the states, right? The choice in the ACCA was Congress acting with the states or Congress acting alone. Right? The states have a lot more to lose by being left out of the landscape entirely because the federal statutory landscape is where the power is. Right? If, states, if states were not included in health law, they would have been left out of the health law game. And that's how this concept of federalism has changed dramatically in the health care landscape because this federalism is coming very counterintuitively from within federal statutes. Congress is giving the states the opportunity, and the power is not from separation. Now, if this seems counterintuitive to you, let me give you a few examples from the current implementation of health reform to illustrate. And I know you all are very familiar with the basics. There are two huge pieces of the ACCA that have a big state component, the Medicaid expansion and the insurance exchanges. In the context of Medicaid, we've seen the states exert a lot of leverage and experimentation from the inside of the statutory scheme, not by staying outside of it. So one prominent example is Arkansas which has negotiated with HHS to effectively privatize its Medicaid system, something it could never have done if it had refused to play and just wash its hands of the statute entirely. The insurance exchange federalism has even more layers. As you know, many states have refused to run their own insurance exchanges, sort of a general political opposition to the ACCA, but the ACCA requires the federal government to run those exchanges for them if they decline to do so. So I hope you can see the irony here. It's the states that were most opposed to the federalization of health care are the ones that, in declining to actually operate their own insurance exchanges, have invited the federal government to come in and take over their insurance markets. Um, putting aside that irony, there's, even, there's some more interesting things happening here from a federalism perspective. And that's how this story defies a lot of the traditional federalism characterizations. As most law students are aware, federalism has several defining features. One of this is this idea that we turn to the states for experimentation. We turn to the states for local variation. Well, as it turns out, the states weren't actually doing a very good job as laboratories when it came to health reform. A bunch of political scientists have shown that the experiments weren't happening at the ideal level thought necessary. And instead, what we have now is a federal statute that is incentivizing the state implementation, the ACC experimentation. The ACCA contains the phrase state flexibility six different times. The statute ex specifically expects 
insurance markets to look different across the nation underneath this umbrella of federal law. Usually, we think the federal government intervenes to have a uniform nationalizing solution. Here, we've got the federal government intervening to encourage the states to act as laboratories, and that's an inversion of the traditional federalism account and the traditional reason we look to the federal, to the federal government. Second, Federalism theory is often measured in terms of cooperation. We hear these terms, cooperative federalism, uncooperative federalism, and so on. But cooperation is very hard to measure in this context. Let me give you a few examples. Take New York. New York is not cooperating because it's not letting the feds come in and, and implement its own exchange, but New York is clearly cooperating because it put up its own exchange, it's functioning well, and everything is going fine. Now let's take Oregon. Oregon tried to cooperate. It's a blue state. It tried to have its own insurance exchange, but things went awry, and now it had to invite the federal government to come in and operate the exchange. As a legal matter, Oregon's exchange looks just like Texas's, right? The federal government is operating them both. But do we really think they're the same for purposes of federalism perspective? What's the difference, right? If it was hard to measure what it means to cooperate, it's hard to measure what federalism success is in this context, or more existentially sort of what federalism is for. And a lot of time in health reform, it seems like federalism is a question of attitude more than anything else. And we know that just can't be quite right. Um, a third defining feature of federalism is this concept of state sovereignty and state autonomy, and it's what a lot of people worry about when states are asked to implement federal law. But I want to offer two responses in this context. First, ask yourselves which states had more autonomy, those states that negotiated for the kind of Medicaid expansion they wanted or designed the insurance exchanges the way they wanted, or those states that washed their hands and let the federal government steamroll in over them. And ask yourselves also what would happen to the whole apparatus of state law if federalism advocates had gotten their way and states had been left out of the statute entirely. Would state legislatures, state bureaucrats, state administrators, state courts have continuing relevance in the area of health law? No. The whole entire field will be federalized. Right? Instead, because the statute relies on state implementation, the entire state legal apparatus has been galvanized to implement the statute. We've got state legislation, new state officials, new state cabinet positions, new state executive orders. Each of these things gives state law continuing relevance in ways I would submit it would not have if the states had been left out of the statute. Um, the final point I want to make here is about the state of federal, state federal negotiations. Um, some have taken the view that the feds have been kind of wimpy, that they've let the states get whatever they want, they're doing whatever they can to negotiate to give them their way. And the point I want to make here is that the federal government and the states have very different interests and time horizons. The whole philosophy of the ACA on the federal side is just to get the thing in the door right, and fix it later. The legislative philosophy is a pragmatic one. The president's interest, unlike many state officials, is long term. He wants to get this thing entrenched, right? So HHS is going to be willing to do whatever it can to let resistance states adopt the statute, right? With every law, every state action enmeshes the statute further in the state's web of politics, law, and citizen life, and will make it harder to undo this thing if, say, a Republican president is elected at this time. So in other words, it's not that the federal government is being wimpy, it's that it's part of a long-term strategy of policy entrenchment that we see all the time in other areas of law and is now applying in the health law context. Um, and this brings me to the last topic, which is the ACA in the courts, because this is another way, obviously, that the statute could be undone despite this policy entrenchment. We all know the statute has been subject to court battles since literally the day it was signed. Um, and now we have the new challenge, King versus Burwell. The case brings together all of the themes of this lecture. It's about the legislative context of the ACA, the statutory interpretation, its federalism story, and its agency implementation. It's also inevitably a story about the unique politics of health reform, and it may, unfortunately, become a story of the next Bush versus Gore. Um, two weeks ago, the Supreme Court took the extremely rare action of granting review in the case before the lower courts had finished deciding it. There are four cases going through the lower federal courts raising the exact same issue as King. Only one case, had, only one of those cases had been finally decided. The D.C. Circuit, the second most powerful court in the nation, had scheduled full court review of the question for December 17th. But rather than wait for the D.C. Circuit to decide, as the court usually does, it reached down and plucked the case out for its own review before the D.C. Circuit could decide it. Uh, this does not bode well for the politicization of this case in the court, but we can still hope 
but the case is going to be decided based on the law, and that's what I'm going to talk about. To really understand what the case is about, you have to go back to, nine, to 2010, when conservative scholar Michael Grave made the following speech about the ACA. This is a quote. The bastard has to be killed as a matter of political hygiene. I don't care how it's done, whether it's dismembered, whether we drive a stake through its heart, whether we tar and feather it and drive it out of town, whether we strangle it, I don't care who does it, whether it's some court someplace or the United States Congress. Any which way, any dollar spent on the goal is worth spending. Any brief filed toward that end is worth filing. He went on to urge a litigating strategy that would concentrate on bits and pieces of the law. King is the direct result of this strategy, right, and has been funded by this strategy. It is brought by the same lawyers who brought the 2012 constitutional case. One of the plaintiffs is also identical. The case seizes on some ambiguous language in the statute to argue that the insurance subsidies are not available on federal exchanges operated by the federal government. This reading is devastating to the statute, as you probably all already know. Without the subsidies, the exchanges won't function as they should in the more than three dozen states with federal exchanges. The ACA is based on an intricate statutory plan, right? It requires insurers to insure everybody at basically equal rates. It then supports the insurance market, which otherwise couldn't absorb these new requirements by requiring everybody to get insured. And it makes that insurance requirement, the so-called mandate, affordable and possible by giving everybody insurance subsidies. Without the subsidies, people are exempt from the mandate, and the insurance markets are going to collapse. And the challengers know this, right? So I hope you're starting to see how King brings the themes of the lecture together. King is about the clarity in which the statute is drafted. I've already told you about the unorthodox process in which the ACA was enacted and its inability to get cleaned up, as statutes usually do, in the legislative process. It's also about the agency's role in interpreting the statute. Actually, what's actually being challenged here is the Treasury regulation, uh, interpreting ambiguous language in, the, in question to allow the subsidies. And of course, King is about federalism, right? King only has legs because so many states unexpectedly decided not to operate their own insurance exchanges, even though the states had insisted in the first place to be given that opportunity. And most importantly, perhaps, King is about a huge and established landscape of black letter federal statutory law that exists apart from and long before this particular case. Two most important pieces of that is something called, one, the Chevron Doctrine, which is a doctrine of administrative law that says the third most cited case in US history. This is not a small case, OK? Chevron says that when a statute is ambiguous, the court, even the Supreme Court, must defer to the agency charged with interpreting it. Here, that's the IRS. The second huge landscape of black letter law is a huge landscape of federal statutory interpretation doctrines. And even in that context, we have years and years of even textualist judges like Justice Scalia telling us that statutory text is to be interpreted holistically, not in a vacuum and in context. But instead, the King challengers are making an argument that is rewriting history to support their reading of the statute, namely that Congress needed some kind of punishment to force the states to operate these exchanges, when I've already told you a legislative story that tells you exactly the opposite, that Congress didn't need to convince the states. There was a fight about letting them in in the first place. With that background, let's go to the statute. It's very hard to do sort of a statutory text thing in a lecture, but I need you to trust me. So I'm going to put the words on the board, and I can talk about them more in Q&A when we get to the end of this part, OK? So the only definition, I'm going to move aside so you can see. The only definition of exchanges in the whole Affordable Care Act is the thing you see on top. <coughs> and it says that exchange, an exchange, so it'll be an American Health Benefit Exchange, established under Section 1311. Section 1311, as you can see, is the state exchange provision. And it says that every state must establish one of those American health benefit exchanges, referred in this title as a capital E exchange. Section 1321, which is entitled State Flexibility, Not State Punishment, says that if the secretary determines that the states can operate the exchanges, the secretary must step in and operate that such capital E exchange. Okay, so the natural reading of this language should tell you that Congress intended and wrote for the federal government to be stepping into the shoes of the state exchange. <coughs> it is true that we have Section 1401. Section 1401 is the section that deals with the IRS tax credits. Section 1401 says the subsidies are computed based on the language in red, which says by determining the number of coverage months for anybody enrolled through an exchange established by the state, under Section 1311. Read in a vacuum, 
that does sound like it means only state exchanges established by the state under section 1311 which is the state exchange provision and that's what the challengers are arguing um, but I've already told you one reading of this which is that the federal governments are operating that such exchange and more importantly there are more than 50 other references in the statute to the word exchange that clearly encompass both the state and the federal government. I've given you just one example up here. This is also in the same section, 1401, the tax credit section, in which the statute says that both state and, look, you see uh, information requirement, this is stuff in red, both section 1311 and section 1321, those are the federal exchanges, must report the amount of subsidies they're doling out to the IRS. This section makes no sense if the federal exchanges can't dole out any subsidies, and there are a whole bunch of other similar provisions that the government has highlighted quite well in its brief. Okay, so the challenges are arguing here that they have the clear text on their side and all the government has is amorphous purpose. That's a strategic framing because the current United States Supreme Court is never gonna privilege purpose over statutory tax. It's also just wrong, right? The government is not arguing anything having to do with legislative history or purpose and it shouldn't. I've already told you the legislative history of the statute is impenetrable and convoluted. Um, instead, all you need is the text alone to determine what the statute means. The text alone makes clear the whole thing depends on insurance subsidies. The text makes clear the statute's emphasis on state flexibility mentioned six times. The textual provisions that assume the federal exchanges will be doling out subsidies that I already mentioned. And the text also allows a very easy comparison to the Medicaid provisions in the, in the ACA, which explicitly say that the states lose their money if they don't cooperate. The failure of that similar threat explicitly made with respect to the federal insurance subsidies proves the government's point because if they did it in Medicaid, they could have made that same explicit threat when it comes to the subsidies. Keep in mind, too, this is one of the last points I make, I'm almost there, that we have a host of statutory interpretation doctrines that assume that Congress doesn't make big changes ambiguously and that Congress does not write statutes to fail. Courts apply the so-called major questions rule, which assumes in Justice Scalia's own words that Congress does not hide elephants in mouse holes. Right? Congress doesn't sneak in big things into federal statutes. We have about 10 different federalism presumptions, which say that Congress doesn't do bad things to states, doesn't impose conditions on states without a clear statement. We have doctrines of constitutional avoidance and severability that are explicitly premised on the presumption that Congress does not write statutes to fail. This is a presumption based on democratic legitimacy and separation of powers. In King, the challengers are arguing something completely impossible, right? That Congress sowed the seeds of the federal exchange's own destruction into the statute, did it intentionally, and did it without saying so clearly, all right? It's an assumption flatly rejected by even Justice Scalia when in the 2012 constitutional challenge, he and the other three dissenters said that the exchanges can't function without the subsidies. And so here we are at the start of year five of the ACA with a statute that completes the transformation of health law from private law to regime of public law. We have a Congress that's tried to repeal the statute more than 40 times. We have state resistance and we have another huge Supreme Court case to be decided before the end of June. Uh, we also have a Supreme Court that as I've shown in other work, doesn't understand health law very well doesn't have much experience with it, and has no coherent set of principles that, the health to, to, that it uses to interpret health law statutes. And so this is why it's time to start thinking more broadly and more deeply about health law as an era of public law and to be lowering it on those terms. So I hope especially the students in here will join me in that effort and start thinking about it that way. Thanks.